Uh, good morning, uh, good afternoon and good evening to our colleagues in Australia. Uh, Garrett Presh, founder of the World Health Innovation Summit, and I'm absolutely delighted to welcome you to our Australian and UK Social Prescribing uh, Champions Scheme webinar. Um, I'm going to hand over to Rob now, who's going to do a short introduction and also give us a brief on social prescribing and the opportunities. That's really what this webinar is about, is exploring how do we implement Sustainable Development Goal 3 through the means of social prescribing to improve people's health and well-being. So do sit back and enjoy today's session. Rob? Uh, thanks very much, Gareth. Um, and thank you all for being online. I want to thank uh, our speakers as well um, and our organisers who put this together. Um, certainly from sitting here in, in, in Melbourne, uh, in Australia, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land that I happen to be on, which is the um, uh, Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. I'd like to pay my respects to their elders past, present uh, and emerging and to acknowledge um, uh, any uh, Aboriginal Torres Strait Islanders uh, who happen to be on, on the call. Um, and to say how important, um, I guess, if you really think about social prescribing, then then there's an enormous amount we can learn from uh, Indigenous knowledge um, in, in this part of the world uh, without, without a doubt. Um, uh, so welcome to you all. Uh, this is wonderful to build on the notion of social prescribing. Uh, and we're building on from a, a seminar that we ran, a webinar that we ran in September last year, um, which was really about personalising care at the population level, the opportunity for social prescribing. And we're lucky enough then to have um, uh, James uh, Sanderson and, and Charlotte Hespie as, as well, um, who uh, happen to be on the call today, which is, uh, we're so pleased. Um, and what we're going to do today is, is really open out this issue of, of social prescribing. Um, and we'll start in the UK um, and, in a sense, honour where this has really developed a, a level of, of huge interest and, and now replication, we hope, um, with uh, James actually providing a background, uh, given his role, and then Bogdan, given his sort of intimate role in, in developing this amongst um, uh, and developing a social uh, prescribing champion scheme. We'd then actually like to turn back to this part of the world, uh, and we're lucky enough to have um, uh, Mark and Charlotte talking with uh, about social prescribing from their perspectives and activity in Australia. Um, and we're going to conclude with Jasmine Davis giving us some next steps and really trying to see how you can get involved. And hopefully we will have some uh, um, uh, some time for questions. In fact, um, I'm sure we will. We'll, we'll certainly make that time. Um, so I'd love to introduce James Sanderson, who's the Director of Personalised Care at NHS England and NHS, NHS Improvement, where he leads actually a range of initiatives uh, that support people to have greater choice and control over their health and well-being. I'll say no more. He's got a fabulous um, track record and he's been really inspirational in, in obviously in the UK, but now helping this get moving in Australia. So, uh, James, over to you. Thank you very much, Rob, and um, a great um, introduction um, from you as well. Um, I, I think that um, social prescribing has the opportunity to create an amazing new and vibrant revolution in the way in which we deliver health and well-being. So medicine is still amazing. Um, we still love drugs and medical interventions. And after the last year, when the whole world has been gripped in dealing with the global pandemic, we've seen the amazing ability of healthcare systems right across the world and the individuals that work in healthcare rise to the challenge of providing support to people. We've also seen the brilliance of science in creating rapid vaccines in order to um, provide protection for individuals um, from the virus. And we've seen the advancements of, of drugs in the treatment um, of people um, that have contracted COVID-19, um, such as dexamethasone, for example. But we really also recognize that whilst medicine is amazing, um, it doesn't always provide the answers um, for the issues that people are dealing with. Um, modern medicine, you know, has been marvellous, but what goes on in hospitals and in GP practices is not what defines our health and well-being. 
We also see the challenges that come from the limitations of a biomedical model, the issues with opioid addiction, the issues with antibiotic um, resistance that we're finding um, are creating problems um, across um, the world. So is there a better way? Is there a way of engaging people differently? And when you look at the evidence, when we looked at the situation over here, we realized that actually at least one in five GP appointments are purely for a non-medical need. People are seeing their GP nowadays um, because they've got issues with the relationship or housing or debt or they're lonely or socially isolated. We also know that upwards of 40% of GP appointments um, where people may well have um, a medical condition underlying, actually the solution to that is not just a biomedical intervention, it's the combination of biomedicine and psychosocial support. So over here in the UK, we launched a program um, as part of the long-term plan, the development of the NHS um, two years ago, uh, which was called Universal Personalised Care. And what this does, it starts to shift the focus to the individual. It, it talks about the fact that we need to give people choice and control over the way their care is planned and delivered, and that that care is based on what matters to them. We need to find the ability to tap into the assets that people bring to their own care, because whilst clinicians will always be experts in conditions or diseases, people are experts in themselves. So how can we find a way of, of involving people differently in their care? And we know that if we don't do this, we know that the impact on individuals is really significant. Uh, we see that people living in the most deprived areas um, of the country, this is again true around the world, people living in the most deprived areas um, tend to um, have life experience, um, life um, um, limiting conditions, um, and mortality that um, is perhaps 10 to 15 years earlier than those living in the most affluent areas. So people that lack um, that connection, that, that, that ability to take control of their health and well-being. So where does social prescribing come in? Well, social prescribing is a fundamental part of this shift to personalised care. Social prescribing has been growing um, in popularity um, in this country. It's been a social movement uh, driven by um, a number of pioneers that have perhaps been, you know, delivering versions of social prescribing for um, maybe 20 or 30 years. But over the last few years, um, we've really been uh, upping our game. And we're now in the position of making sure that social prescribing can happen universally across the country. So we've committed to the development of uh, link workers in primary care across every GP practice um, in the country. So we're going to have over the next few years around four and a half thousand link workers, people that we dedicated to sitting down with patients, finding out what matters to them, building a plan around their needs, looking holistically at their lives, looking to break down the barriers um, that prevent them from achieving their health outcomes and creating solutions that will connect people really, really carefully with activities in their community that are meaningful to them. And this is something that um, we are really committed to. It's now part of the GP contract. Um, we now have um, well over a thousand link workers um, in place. We've exceeded our target on recruitment of link workers during the course of um, this year. And we're starting to build a whole ecosystem for social prescribing that surrounds the GP practice. Um, as chief executive of the National Academy for Social Prescribing that was set up by the Secretary of State for Health and Social Care in 2019. We're championing the opportunities for social prescribing to thrive. We have a number of community programs. Our Thriving Communities program is working with voluntary community faith and social enterprise organizations to try and um, enable them to um, create opportunities to support people in new and innovative ways. We're working um, with um, Gareth and colleagues in the WHO um, and um, the United Nations Global Sustainability in Institute Index. And we're working to create a global alliance for social prescribing that can um, start to um, raise the awareness um, around the world. And we're looking at the way in which we improve the evidence base by working with um, a collaborative of universities and raise the noise levels for social prescribing. So I'm really pleased um, to be part of this conversation today. 
hopefully that's given you a little bit of insight into um, the work that we're doing in the UK. Um, but I, I think that um, the um, approach that you have in Australia, um, the energy and enthusiasm for this area of work is, is absolutely phenomenal. And I've been delighted to have several conversations um, with colleagues um, that are on the call today um, talking about how um, social prescribing can be advanced in Australia. And we're really committed um, to supporting you all um, with your work. You're going to hear now from um, Bogdan, who is a pioneer um, in the development of, of, of champions for social prescribing and, and just wanted to pay tribute to the amazing work that Bogdan's done in raising awareness um, in this country and really enabling social prescribing to take hold um, across um, medical schools and colleges. So I'll hand back to you now, Rob. Thank you. Rob, you're on mute. It's a wonderful commentary there. I mean, the notion of, of really new and vibrant approaches that you're talking about, James, um, this notion of really involving and engaging um, people in their own uh, health, uh, giving them giving them power over their destiny, I think is so important. And and, and the way that you've structured it, using link workers, um, embedding them in the in the in the ecosystem, as you pointed it point out. Um, and as I just love the notion that uh, you talked about raising the noise level. Well, I won't yell, but I'm uh, getting pretty excited about it. Um, I mean, I know as a as a as a doctor myself, then we cannot treat people into good health. Um, it's simply not enough. We, well, I was this morning talking at a, at a um, local government um, health and wellbeing workshop, we realised how important all the big issues around um, the way people live, how they live, where they live, in what circumstances is so important in determining their health. Um, and luckily enough, our next speaker, as uh, James mentioned, uh, uh, Dr. Bogdan uh, Chiva Gurkha, who's the founder and chair of the NHS Social Prescribing Champion Scheme. Um, and as James mentioned, he's done an enormous amount in uh, getting this going and, and raising the noise level. So Bogdan, over to you and thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm, I'm deeply humbled by the introduction. Certainly, way too formal for me because I still associate myself with a with a medical student. And um, back back in time, looking back at the moment, and and I think as much as I'd like to take credit for everything that happened, I think we should look at the army of medical students that's been pushing this subject across the UK and and throughout the world as well. And so, first of all, seeing so many medical students attending today, I think this brings back good memories. Um, first of all, because I've, I've only graduated around two years ago um, and looking back when I was in my maybe third year of medical school, I remember how this started. And I think the, the UK champion scheme um, for social prescribing started as it does today in Australia with a bunch of enthusiastic, motivated um, medical students um, alongside some and enthusiastic mentors willing to support and guide them along the way. Um, so we, we're off for a good start. And with that in mind, I think I'd like to start by talking a bit about the untapped potential of the future generation, and I guess the potential of students. We have so many policy documents um, that, that we write and that the government um, pushes out from time to time, for example, a 10-year plan for healthcare, but we rarely involve the students in those documents. And I guess if we want to ensure a bright future, um, we need to ensure that the, the third household all of, of the future generations um, and doctors and allied professionals um, is fertile. And I think with that in mind, I remember when, and this is a this is a particular story, when I was doing one of my assignments and I was in surgery, um, and there was one of the surgeons who asked me if it was really necessary to go to a conference and talk about social prescribing. Um, and I put my assignment on the line because I believed so much into this. And I remember um, having the lowest grade in this, in this essay, almost failing the module, um, going to this conference, just believing that there's there's much more than, than just the biomedical dimension. Um, and I think, that's just the, just standing up sometimes for, for what you believe in. But I, I also want to go back to the idea that students should also feel empowered and should also feel um, that they have the, the, the power and the ability to co-design um, the medical school curriculum. So with that in mind, I just want you all uh, medical students, uh, uh, be it medical students or allied health professional students who are joining us today and to feel empowered and to feel that you have a say um, in what's happening around you. And I guess let's talk a bit about the problem um, and what, what made us 
get this started as well. We were, of course, inspired by, by our mentors and what was happening around. But I think that the broader theme here is the 21st century changing demographic. As we live longer, um, we have technology that helps us live better. But we are facing um, an ever-increasing obesity crisis. We, we're facing a mental health epidemic um, or a loneliness crisis, and it's only going to get worse. The big, biggest problem from my point of view is the population, which is about to double by 2050. And so we look at the doctor numbers, which are going to remain more or less the same, or there will be a minimal increase. And so there's a gap between numbers and healthcare professionals. So we live in a century where telling patients what to do, I guess not only that has become inappropriate, but will also become impossible given the numbers that we will face. And with all the information available, we shouldn't really be upset when patients have access to so much information, but rather harness this opportunity to enable and empower patients and to become active partners in their health, um, if possible, of course. I guess what I'm trying to say is that before we reach disease, um, we need to work in collaboration with patients to co-design and co-produce mechanisms of staying healthy and um, that will prevent disease from occurring in the first place. And so I think it's a proposal for patients meeting us halfway and working with a model that does that. And that's in my head what social prescribing does as well. Um, can we do that or are we doing that? Well, here's the big problem. I think in, we're still teaching using algorithms. So for example, if you have a high blood pressure patient, then you follow the blood pressure guidelines and give antihypertensives. Um, if diabetes, then you follow that protocol. And so we are constantly taught in medical school to react to disease. So we are giving a problem. So if X, then Y. Um, but we know that life is not an algorithm. Um, or if it is an algorithm, then we, we have some serious data sets that are missing uh, from there as well. And I'd like to think about the, the healthcare system as a bit of a bottle um, with, with different holes inside it. And so we are really good at patching things up. So once you have a hole, you put a plaster on the hole acutely and you don't think about the long term. And then comes another hole and you have to put another plaster. And then you get overwhelmed by, by the amount of plasters that you put in there and you've actually not made any long term changes. Um, and I think this is not only a UK-based problem. As we opened the conversation in Australia, I think it's a worldwide problem. And I've seen this um, both um, in, in the US, um, but also in other countries that, that have had the opportunity to practice and, um, and go into hospitals. So I guess my question is, how do we move away from a system just focused on treating illnesses um, uh, towards one that is based on promoting well-being and preventing ill health? And, and for that, we need to consider wider determinants of health and we need to consider what James was, was talking about and about health behaviors and lifestyle and, and places and communities that we live in. And Sir Michael Mar Marmot's um, work has been instrumental in mapping out the impact of social determinants of health and um, helping us understand that 80% of our health is the result of social determinants of health. And this is where our obsession with the biopsychosocial model stems from. Um, we are, or we seem to be good at the biological side, but the psychosocial area, um, not so much so. And I guess this brings me to explain what social prescribing meant for me as a student when I was at your stage, when, when many of you are medical students today attending, um, as well as later as a, as a doctor um, today. I guess first and foremost is the model that we talked about, that James, um, and I clearly spoke, spoke about, about the link worker, the community support and, and providing um, the help for, for the patients to, to receive access to these activities and to, to have their needs um, not only heard, but also addressed. But secondly, for me, it was the deeper layer of, of the subject. It was the concept of social prescribing. There's this idea of being able to shift those values and beliefs among the future generation and for us as future doctors and future healthcare professionals to understand that we could co-design, co-produce, and work together with patients, meet them halfway, um, and, and design healthcare together, and bring health um, at the core of our local communities in that sense as well. Is social prescribing new? Um, well, the name and concept might sound new, um, but we, we talk a lot, a lot about this when we consider the evidence. If you really strip down social prescribing and peel it layer by layer like an onion, and um, we can clearly see it's composed of several uh, concepts that we have uh, plenty of evidence for, such as motivation interviewing, shared decision making, biopsychosocial model, and, and, and so on. And I'll just end with a, with a social prescribing champion team, which we hope um, we, can, we can start um, in Australia with your enthusiasm and with, with your support. 
Um, and it, it's not a scheme in itself, but more of a, of a movement. It's a movement among the future generation. So the social prescribing um, champions team um, was born with a few medical students, uh, many of which are here today. So J Daisy and Joel as well. Um, and we decided to select a few champions across the UK and they had three core aims. First of all, they had to learn about the subject, um, so just familiarize themselves. Um, and then secondly, they had to um, share that knowledge with some of their peers. So they would do informal teaching um, in their medical schools. And then thirdly, they would have to reflect and disseminate that knowledge at various conferences. And we repeated this model over the years. Um, and boy, did that lead to success because we, um, we have implemented this into the curriculum um, in the UK. Um, and we've, we've conducted research studies, but we've also uh, managed to establish a, an army of thousands of medical students, engineer doctors who have been involved in the, in the movement so far. So I do hope you, you'll get to hear from the medical students involved in the, in the scheme later on as well. Um, I wish you all the best in trying to pioneer this in Australia. You have our support and remember beyond the model itself, it's the cultural shift and change that is well overdue in the 21st century. Thank you. Lovely, thanks very much, uh, Bogdan. Um, and some great comments there, which I perhaps I could underline this notion of, and for all of you online, the untapped potential of you as students. Um, all of us on this absolutely um, believe in that. I'm just so pleased that you're um, you're on you're online. Um, the notion that we can meet patients halfway, um, that life is not an algorithm. I love that. Um, you know, this is a sense of, of, of having a much more nuanced approach to, to how we care for people, work with people, allow them to participate in their own, um, in their own well-being as, uh, as well. Um, we're now going to, and thank you very much, Bogdan, we'll now move back here to, um, to Australia. Uh, and we're lucky enough to have Mark uh, Morgan speaking. Uh, and Mark is a professor of general practice at Bond University uh, in Australia. He's the chair of the Royal Australian College of, of General Practitioners Expert Committee on Quality uh, Care. He's on our National Preventative Health Strategy, which has just come out with a, a new uh, development. So we hope that social prescribing will be part of that. Um, uh, Mark, welcome. Delighted to have you uh, tonight. Thank you, Rob. Thank you. It's been a fantastic conversation so far. And um, I want to start by describing the need that I see for social prescribing as a GP in Australia. So I see people who experience isolation, they're lonely. I see people who need accessible local physical activity that's sustainable and doesn't rely on referrals to um, expensive practitioners to deliver that. I see an alternative to medication therapy. Um, I, I see a need for legal advice and language advice and cooking advice and things like that which I, I struggle to help with as a GP. And I see a need to support volunteering and yet I see a need for people with particular conditions to be able to meet peers with those conditions but that's difficult to arrange when, when, when we have confidentiality issues and, and so on. And I see a need for communities to be strengthened. We know where communities are tight-knit and, and working closely together things work better. Um, so I see those community groups that struggle through lack of, of support and lack of engagement with people. And, and I'd love to see a system that can help that. So what we've talked about before, moving away from an illness care system to a health system, um, can tap into those, those gaps in, in the way that we deliver healthcare at the moment. Um, lucky enough in Australia to have been approached by the Consumers Health Forum, which is one of our peak bodies for the voice of um, people that access the health system. And together with the Consumers Health Forum and other partners such as the um, mental health groups, we set up a round table back in November 2019. And we were lucky enough to have James come along and talk at that event to really explore how we could introduce what's happening in the UK into an Australian setting and into our healthcare system. And I must say, I'm really envious of the UK's ability to have a kind of one system approach and to do grand experiments um, across the whole country uh, from time to time. Um, 
that sort of thing just doesn't happen here and it's traded very easily at all. But, but it's quite, a, you know, be lovely if you could just with a sweep make something happen. We have to chip away at it. We have to put budget submissions in. We have to, um, to demonstrate um, success in a staged rollout way. And that's what we've been trying to design. The key features that came out of that round table is that the GPs all mostly said they were doing social prescribing, but we're pretty clear that one GP has a particular group of activities that they sometimes connect patients to, and the GP in the room next door has a different set. And there's no coordination. Um, link worker role is, is very much unfilled in Australia at the moment, uh, and so that's a key role that needs to be thought about. And some, in some cases, that might be a trained practice nurse that is suitable for that role. It might be a community mental health nurse, or it might be a new workforce um, whose specific role and training is on being link workers. We also know in Australia that um, there's been precious little connection between the health service and the local government. Now, local government support community organisations. They produce um, directories of community organisations, things that people can do, and they have very little connection back to the health service and vice versa. So we could solve that problem without any great input of, of, of funds. So um, Australia is, I think, ripe for a social prescribing revolution to change the way that we deliver healthcare, as Bogdan was saying. Um, and I think medical schools are a really important part of that jigsaw puzzle. At Bond University, uh, like many contemporary uh, medical programs, we teach a lot of the program on the basis of um, discussing cases. And I'd like to think that social prescribing is part of the toolkit that is used in the discussion for each and every vignette that is discussed as part of the curriculum. We also have a centre um, called the Handbook of Non-Drug Intervention, which is hosted by the Royal Australian College of GPs um, and led from Bond University. And that's a real focus on evidence-based um, treatments that don't involve prescribing, another cultural shift that can be supported by social prescribing movement. So what I'm really looking forward to is what the next steps are. One next step is to, be, to put in a budget submission for a mere $70 million just to get this started. Um, we'll see how that goes. Um, but I, I really believe that if, uh, if, if medical students can be infused, if uh, there's more noise around social prescribing, um, and if the uh, examples of social prescribing that are flourishing in different little pockets within Australia can be shared more broadly, then we could see a shift in the culture here. Thank you. Uh, lovely. Thanks very much, Mark. I mean, it's really interesting comments you made about <clears throat> the link between so, uh, local government um, and, in a sense, uh, general practices and, and the healthcare system as a whole. And uh, as I said before, I was at a local government workshop this morning and there were no GPs there, interestingly enough. Um, on one hand, on the other hand, in, in Victoria, we've recently had a Royal Commission, um, really deep dive into our mental health care system and one of the primary recommendations is about the, the importance uh, and the funding for social prescribing so which I think was a was a, was a great move so uh, I'm really pleased about that but uh, as Mark mentioned we want to have a social prescribing um, revolution um, our next speaker and we we're lucky enough to have Charlotte speak uh, at our last uh, webinar is Charlotte Hespie who's the associate professor and head of general practice and primary care research uh, at the University of Notre Dame uh, in Sydney. She uh, also works um, in clinical general practice in inner city Glebe um, as a principal of a 19 doctor group practice. She's been very actively involved um, with, uh, with the College of General Practitioners and she's going to be really taking us further into the Australian context um, and the opportunity for us to also include not only medical students but public health, allied health students uh, and communities as well. So Charlotte, over to you and thank you very much. Thank you, Rob. Um, so hi, what a fantastic opportunity. 
uh, this is, and I'm very excited to be able to share with you some of my thoughts and the opportunities. Like um, Mark before me, I'm an Australian GP who has to work in a system that's a little bit, uh, shall I say, dislocated because we have different funding puddles uh, for, that we have to work in. So we're lucky enough to be a universal Medicare um, system where everybody has access to healthcare, but we have to work alongside uh, sort of systems that are funded in alternate ways, which means that a lot of what we do becomes really awkward to navigate. My experience as a GP is that I've always done social prescribing, but I didn't know that what I was doing was social prescribing. And I think that that's a really key thing to do because I know when I talk to a lot of GPs already, they, they're not familiar with the term social prescribing in the Australian context and don't, it sort of like goes, well, you're not going to tell me to do something more with prescribing. It's no, this is actually about you listening, you doing the skills that you normally do and hearing that what is actually needed is not a prescription for medicine, but actually just actually meeting the patient with their needs and hearing that they actually need assistance with accessing better housing, with being able to go and find a lawyer to sort out some of the really complicated legal stuff in their lives, to actually sit down and go, you really do need to get off your bottom and walk because actually there's <clears throat> more evidence about the role of exercise in improving your health outcomes than there's ever going to be in me giving you a prescription for a medicine that you need to go and pick up at the pharmacy. And, but then doing the fish hook, what I call the fish hook, is actually engaging them with why they need to do that. So we have such great opportunities in the Australian setting, but, but how do we do it? And how do we make sure that you as a medical student is also engaged in that? So one of the, the first things that has been happening for me in the context that I'm working in is we're using a thing called health pathways, which I'm not all that sure. I know you use some similar sorts of things in the UK, but when we talk about health pathways, it's actually a website that has been what we call localised to your own footprint. So for me, in the inner city of Sydney, I have a health pathways site that does all of the pathways for me to access a G as a GP in my own footprint. Now that might not sound so revolutionary to you in the UK, this is very revolutionary to us in Australia and it's absolutely fantastic. But what it's really good at, at having done recently is an offer and I can really relate to that. I sort of think, well, I know that I need to send this 75 year old to an exercise program, but I have no idea where those exercise programs are because there is nothing that actually otherwise links me to it. So I can go now to my health pathways site and I can actually go and find what all of those things are. It also gives me ideas about other things that I might offer in terms of social activities, you know, because again, um, in the work that I do, I've seen that one of the biggest things is that 30% of our patients are lonely. 30%, that's a huge number. And, you know, how do we, you know, fix that up? I mean, we know that it's actually only gotten worse in the last um, 12 months with the pandemic. Now, let me tell you, Australia is the lucky country. We have not had to suffer what the UK has had in terms of lockdowns and social isolation, but we have still suffered from social isolation. And there's huge repercussions in terms of mental health. So again, it's about finding those links through things like health pathways. How does that link in then, though, to the way in which I think about for a medical student and what you can do? Well, the great thing is that health pathways are accessible to everybody. So when we're teaching both our registrars um, in general practice and medical students, it's a great teaching tool because once you start to see it, you start to realise the power of doing those sorts of things. Um, I know that I'm sort of, I, I did an audit once um, of, of what we were talking about already about how much social prescribing do we do? And I actually, we got a higher figure um, from our practice and that might just be because we've got a lot of people who um, socially um, disadvantaged. And I reckoned, when we did that audit, there was 55% of the conversations that we had was actually around accessing them to things that um, actually empowered people to make differences in their lives that, that they had, might not have thought about or they just needed support in the conversation. 
I'm aware that there's other stuff that I could or shouldn't be doing. How does this link in with all the other services? Because as a GP, I'm in a prized position because my skills about social prescribing are the fact that my view of a patient is as a whole person. I don't actually think of them about their lungs. I don't think of them as their hearts. I don't think of them as their abdomen, which is unfortunately the way medicine has been tended to be taught in the Australian Medical School. I very much have that beautiful role of being able to think of them as a whole person and that then gives me an opportunity to teach in a completely different fashion about how we actually need to mesh the complexities of the real world together and that means that there's lots of other people with skills how do I link in the occupational therapist who's down the road because they actually bring a whole lot of those other skills and how do we work together? How do I make sure that the dietitian who's doing the prescribing is actually part of the conversations that we're doing together? The only way we can really empower that to happen is by actually getting people to sit in the same room and actually get the skills that we each bring. Again, Australian setting hasn't been good for that. We've tended to be very siloed. Um, and But we have more and more opportunities now, and particularly in medical schools, where I hope um, and would encourage everybody to actually go out and talk to. Well, as a nurse, what are the roles that you do and bring that I can actually then access and use and bring um, to better patient care? I've probably been talking too much, but I think I'll just, the last thing I'll say is that disruption has been a really powerful tool. In the last 12 months in the Australian setting, I have seen changes in our healthcare system that we would have never, ever seen if we hadn't had a pandemic. It was amazing. In 10 days, we achieved telehealth consultations in the Australian general practice setting. It was 10 years away if we were lucky prior to the pandemic. I hate what we've had to go through, but it was a really good exercise. Disruption is great. Go out there, be disruptive. By being disruptive, we can actually bring about change. People don't like change, but give it to them, they take it and they realise and can embrace all of the joys of it. Thanks. And here's to some great social prescribing. Uh, great. Thanks, Charlotte. Um, and thanks for the great examples. And in fact, talking about health pathways, which I'll go away and look up straight um, after this. Um, and thanks for your enthusiasm. I hope that you can sort of spread that amongst uh, so many doctors, let alone uh, uh, students as well. And our next um, speaker is Jasmine uh, Davis. Um, and just before she starts, just to let you know, um, we've got time for questions. Uh, Jasmine will be speaking and then we'll, we'll actually have quite a bit of time for, for, uh, for questions. So uh, uh, please let us know um, and Gareth can indicate how that's, uh, that's done. But uh, I'd love to introduce uh, Jasmine, who's uh, a doctor of medicine student at University of Melbourne, where I am, uh, and she's also doing the uh, intercalated degree, the her Master of Public Health this year, um, and we're delighted to have her uh, involved in that. She's on the <clears throat> Australian Medical Students Association, a national executive uh, as national projects officer, um, picking up so many uh, interesting initiatives. Uh, such as the AMSA Queer, AMSA Gender Equity and AMSA Mental Health um, and Vampire Cup Project. So, uh, Jasmine, over to you and thanks. Great. Thank you so much, Rob. I'm just going to quickly share my screen here. Alrighty. Cool. Thank you, everyone, for coming along tonight and to all the incredible speakers. Um, I'm sure you'll all feel the same in that this is a very inspiring event and I feel very motivated to go and make some really substantial change in this area of social prescribing. So just to let everyone know, um, as Rob said, I work with the Australian Medical Students Organisation and we're a student non-for-profit organisation representing the 23 medical schools and 17,000 medical students across Australia. So I'm here to sort of speak about how you can get involved as a medical student in this space because we at ANSA are really interested in this initiative and hope that um, this can really take off in Australia and we want to be involved in that. So what, um, what we're looking at doing in the really near future is setting up a social prescribing working group. 
And this will be a group of medical students who are really passionate about this area. And if that's, some, if that's you after this event or before this event, um, please consider applying for this working group. We'll, what we'll be doing is trying to have a look at the feasibility of setting something up like the Social Prescribing Champions Scheme that Bogdan spoke about, because we think that's a really good one way that we could potentially roll this out in Australia. Um, so we'll be sending out some information if you registered for this event. Um, we'll be sending the information about how to sign up for this working group and apply. Um, and also it'll be on our AMSA social media, which you can see um, linked here. So if you're interested in that, um, please keep an eye out. I'm also here to let you know that if you're not a medical student, this does not mean you can't get involved in social prescribing. We really do need an interdisciplinary approach as that is the whole idea behind social prescribing is it's all of us working together um, to get behind a social movement that can really make a substantial change for a lot of people. So. If you're interested in this and not a medical student, please don't hesitate to get in contact with us. Um, we've got the amazing Sean Slade here, who has been really instrumental in getting this up and running. And Grace Newman as well, who's another medical student who is um, really willing to chat with you and see how you can get involved as either allied health, public health students, or if you're just someone who is really keen on this idea in Australia, please feel free to get in touch with any of us at any point. Um, so yeah, that's it from me, um, and I'll hand it back uh, to Rob. Thank you. Thanks very much, Desmond. Uh, and now I'll open it for questions. So uh, we'd love to hear um, any of your questions or queries, if we can uh, answer any of them. Uh, then we have a team here, Daisy and Joel, um, Grace um, and Sean, as well as Jasmine can respond, as well as Bogdan, uh, and obviously the, um, the other speakers, Gareth and, and um, uh, Mark and, and Charlotte. So if you have questions, um, then please let us know and, and Gareth can bring you up. Perfect. And whilst we're waiting for questions, could I also just suggest Daisy and Joel, who are two of the medical students here, um, and whilst you're all asking, you're asking your questions as well, it would be great to hear some comments from them or, you know, maybe some tips um, from medical students um, involving the scheme in that sense. And then please, please do ask your questions um, so we can answer that as well. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name's Daisy. Um, I'm also an intercalating medical student, um, just like Jasmine, intercalating this year in clinical education. And I lead the Student Champion Scheme. Um, my biggest tips to any students wanting to get involved would be just go for it. Uh, if you're interested in social prescribing, uh, the working groups that Jasmine described sound great. So I would definitely get involved with those. Um, if you'd like to get involved with anything, um, International Social Prescribing Day is happening next week on the 18th of March. And you can download resources packs online and join us in celebrating it. I'll hand over to Joel now quickly to introduce himself. Hi, everyone. I'm Joel. I'm a final year medical student and I intercalated two years ago in public health. Um, I do the international stuff for the social prescribing scheme here in the UK. Um, and I think the biggest tip I'd have for people, as um, Charlotte said, is that a lot of doctors and clinicians are already doing social prescribing, they just don't know it. So when you reach out to them, bear that in mind and realize that you may not have to use the exact terms and phrasing, but once they realize what you're talking about, most of them seem to have a light bulb moment. And that usually brings you closer and makes you, helps you to develop better connection with them. So alongside going for it and doing things and sharing things like the social prescribing day on the 18th of March, also remember a lot of clinicians actually doing what we're kind of saying, they just don't know it. And once you bring them to that point of need and where they realize that it's a light bulb moment and you get a lot more, you get a lot further. Um, and that's all I'd have to give as a tip. Thank you. Great, I think uh, Gareth, we've got a question. So from Erica Musgrove, in the context of extreme remoteness in some parts of Australia, how do you think social prescribing could be implemented? So maybe Charlotte or Mark, you want to have a crack at that? I'm happy to jump in first. Um, I think actually in remote areas of Australia where health services are very thin on the ground, 
there's a, a much stronger requirement for social prescribing as an option for for people to improve their health and uh, and, and and work on uh, on health. Um, I, I think there are examples as well of um, remote indigenous communities that, that just naturally work together in um, what would be seen if we called it that a social prescribing method. So I, I don't see distance and remoteness as a limit. Um, I actually think it might be more complex in uh, the busy world of inner cities to get effective social prescribing uh, working in a sustainable way. Thanks, Mark. And I might um, uh, hop in there too. Um, the, I think that definitely the advantage of a lot of the remote rural um, communities is actually they have a, um, a social connectedness with uh, each other in a way that the inner city doesn't. And I think there's an experience of more loneliness in some of the sort of high rise in the inner city than you will get in remote um, settings. And one of the good things about that is that then you actually understand who is doing what. You might not have as easy access to some of the bigger programs, but you actually, everyone will know. So for instance, I worked in a very remote Northern Territory um, clinic where it was wonderful because you only had to turn to the person next to you and ask them and they would know someone who would know someone who would know how to and what to and some options, which I don't have access to in the inner city in the same way at all. So there's advantages in being remote because of that sort of more closely linked um, community of people around you. And certainly you get to really appreciate the skills of the people that you work with. So you actually understand better the role of the OT and the social worker, for instance, because you're actually working with each other very closely on a day-to-day -day basis. Lovely, thanks, Sean. Sean, did you want to ask a question? Or oh, just before you do, we'll ask from our, another MD, MPA student, Ross, um, who says, in terms of education, when in the pipeline of training doctors would this be most effective? Medical school, during internship, fellowship, should this be limited only to some specialisations? So um, again, perhaps James and uh, Bogdan, you'll have a crack at this one. Thanks, Rob. Um, I, I mean, we've been very successful in implementing um, social prescribing and training on personalised care uh, within um, medical um, schools and colleges. Um, we set up recently the um, Personalised Care Institute um, alongside the um, uh, Royal College of GPs, um, but in partnership with other medical royal colleges. Um, and they've developed specific curriculum on how you embed um, personalised care and social prescribing training um, into um, medical schools. Um, and we know that this is now being rolled out at scale across uh, medical schools and colleges um, across the country. Um, and it's not just about the core skills for social prescribing, it's about how you um, properly train clinicians in having shared decision-making conversations, how you train them to undertake personalised care and support planning conversations, um, engage with patients in a, in a different way, um, appreciative inquiries, and making sure that the way in which we're involving people in their care is meaningful to them because um, a lot of people say that they don't understand the health information. I think it's um, about 40% of people say they don't understand the health information that they're provided with. So even when we do engage with people, we need to make sure that we're getting those messages through and we're um, actually um, transferring um, knowledge and skills and confidence to individuals so that they can um, live um, lives um, very, very capably. Um, so I think it's incredibly important that we embed um, not just um, the practice of social prescribing, uh, but also the skills to support personalised care into medical schools and colleges right from the beginning. This should be part of the way in which um, our future um, clinicians um, are, are trained and developed. Thank you so much, James. And I, I echo those thoughts as well. And I think it's, it, it's crucial and important to embed them. I'm gonna focus a bit on the first part um, of the question as well, and at which stage should we have this in the in the clinical training or in the medical education curriculum? 
I do a lot of work for getting to medical school and supporting lots of students from schools as well. And I would argue that the shift in cultures and values should even start from school. I look forward to the day of being on an interview panel at a medical school and having a student coming in. And you know how most of the times there's the narrative about I went on a placement and saw some stitching and blood gushing and I attended surgery. I look to the day where a student would come in and talk about the sexiness of social prescribing and talk about the biopsychosocial model instead. And so I really look forward to that day when, when the biopsychosocial model becomes as sexy as surgery and because it should be. And I think we should start as early as possible because the way you shape those values and beliefs among the future generation is how they will be harnessed in the future. We know from studies that once doctors qualify, um, the, the, the culture and the, the values have already kind of been formed and they're already stressed by the job. So it's quite difficult to, um, to acquire new, new values and skills in terms of the, the educational aspect. And there's one study showing um, that those who were trained in social prescribing believed that social prescribing were, was um, easing their work, it was making their days um, run quicker, whereas those who weren't trained in social prescribing in medical school, um, the study showed that it they, they would see it as resistance and they perceived it as adding to their workload. So it's all about those cultures and how they're being shaped within medical school, I think. I would start as early as possible, and I would say regardless of the specialization, I think we owe our patients a conversation whereby we ask for their opinions on what we're doing, and we are co-designing care, and we are mapping out the problems, and we're drawing lines in between the problems and solve them together, regardless of the specialty that you will ever end up in. I think we should, we should honor that to our patients. Lovely. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Bogdan. I mean, really key point there about how social prescribing actually can enhance your role as a, as a, um, as a practitioner. Uh, it gives you more, in a sense, ideas, control, uh, um, uh, information, um, activities that you can actually engage with your patients in rather than giving you less. Uh, and, and the more you know about it, the, the more you can engage in it and earlier in the, in the course. Um, because as Bogdan points out, Medicine is an incredibly strong occult form of acculturation. Once you hit um, the, the hospitals, then the four walls of the hospitals are telling you what to do. Well, you need to be able to, in a sense, appreciate there's a much bigger world and in, I think in many ways, uh, incredibly interesting world where we do engage with patients, we do engage with the issues that fundamentally will help people be well. Um, uh, so thanks, Bogdan, that's a terrific um, approach. Uh, from Genevieve Dingle, I'm interested in the panelists' thoughts about how link workers might be funded both within primary care and in the community. And it probably relates um, to Australia. So I'll ask maybe Mark and, and Charlotte to comment, but also to come back to how, how this got moving in the UK. So uh, Charlotte, perhaps you first. Or Mark, yeah. Oh, oh, back to you, Mark. Okay. The controller has put my face up first, sorry. Um, <laughs> I, I think there's not always a need for the link worker role to be a, uh, taken on board by a brand new workforce. So I think there is a need for um, taxpayer money to be invested in link workers to support wider social prescribing, but I also think we can tap into some existing uh, opportunities. Charlotte's already described how health pathways can, can list social prescribing to enable anybody that's accessing those health pathways to engage in social prescribing. Um, one of my projects was to train practice nurses to use social prescribing as part of the management for uh, depression in people with heart disease and diabetes, and that worked fine under existing funding envelopes. And uh, neighbourhood houses, which are the kind of community supported um, centres, engage in social prescribing within their existing um, funding allowance. So, so it, it can start and it can be chipped away at with existing funding, but I think this is a, an opportunity to, to, to invest in better healthcare and to make strong arguments that it's well worth spending that money on um, an additional workforce. Thanks, Mark. Um, I agree 100%. I think we do a really good job in the Australian setting of not having um, a whole lot of the support, but we know that we could do a whole lot better if we've got more. 
a lot of the projects that I've been involved with where we're able to really enhance some of the social prescribing work we do is when we can develop a partnership with the primary health network and or our local hospital that where we look at services that we know are both being underutilised and that there's a particular need. So, for instance, um, one of the issues for us has been around how do we access patients to better supports around the use of alcohol and drugs. And by having a sort of a liaison person come into our practice who's linked with the hospital services, but also with the PHN and some of their, their funded services, we've been able to specifically um, a, heighten the awareness of all the GPs in the practice about that as a really good tool to facilitate and improve people's outcomes, um, but also sort of utilising funds that are already there. Then if you can demonstrate that that really works, you get the funding then built in. So for us, that particular um, sort of link person has gotten ongoing funding because we demonstrated that the project worked might not be as good as having a dedicated person in a practice, but it's a really good start because you can then use that as the evidence that this is what actually facilitates better uptake and um, a, a better activation of everybody, both the doctors, um, the nurses, and the, the sort of the staff as well as the patients in what we're doing. I was just getting carried away with listening to everyone's fantastic comments, uh, realizing that I was up next. Um, we, we've we've made a massive leap forward um, in um, England um, with the development of the link worker role, and obviously that is a significant investment um, to have those new roles in primary care. And we, we we've been privileged to um, be supported by um, government and ministers and and the Secretary of State for Health and Social Care, Matt Hancock, has championed social prescribing for for a number of years now, and and having that that joined up support across the healthcare system, across government uh, and across um, the social movement that's happening is, is fairly unique really, because social prescribing started as a social movement. It started with people championing it. It started um, as a ground up um, uh, program. Um, so bringing that together um, with now a national commitment, um, I think is is obviously the um, the brilliant opportunity um, that, that, is, uh, that, 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 that is desired um, across all systems. Um, one of the things that um, we have developed now with the um, partnership with um, uh, the World Health Innovation Summit with Gareth and the National Academy for Social Prescribing and WHO and UN GSII is the creation of a global social prescribing alliance. And what we're looking to do is support systems across the world um, with a flat pack for social prescribing, um, with the development of um, clinical champion schemes like the discussion that we're having today, um, the opportunity to um, create um, the tools that are required to implement social prescribing um, at scale and successfully um, with a really sound quality model in place, and also um, the um, economic model for this. Um, so we're working on how we can develop an economic model um, that demonstrates the value that um, uh, economies and countries can um, gain from implementing social prescribing because this this isn't just about improving people's health and well-being this is about transforming the way in which society can function as well and we know that healthy people are going to contribute to the economy we know that systems um, that across the world that are struggling could benefit from new and innovative ways to work so uh, the innovation that we want to bring forward through the global social prescribing alliance um, is part of how we can um, support this team and others to thrive. Great. Um, what a terrific note to finish on <clears throat> the note. Thanks, James, about this is about transforming the way our society works. And I couldn't agree more in terms of, of really revolutionising the way that um, we mentioned before, we can, we can work in partnership with patients and in a sense with so many different uh, groups, agencies within our community and, and improve connectedness across uh, across the globe. Um, I'd now quickly like to thank very much um, James and Bogdan, Mark, Charlotte, uh, Jasmine, as well as um, Joel and Daisy uh, for your contributions today. We, we hugely appreciate your time and your, uh, your effort and your enthusiasm. Um, and also to thank Sean Slade and, and Grace Newman who are developed this whole project, uh, uh, the webinar. Um, we're really grateful for your work. So I'll now hand
back to Gareth, um, who will wrap things up. But thank you very much. Uh, thanks, Rob. Uh, what an exciting and uh, interesting webinar. I um, My thoughts were just to jump in at every moment, listening to the examples across Australia and the UK. But just to say, uh, if we go back to Bogdan, when he talked about the why and the, the explosion in population that we're facing by 2050, up to 10 billion people, and then looking at how do we actually do this from an economic perspective and the model that we've developed through the Global Social Prescribing Alliance and what we're currently doing and the next steps. So if we look at why we need to do this, as Bogdan mentioned and, and colleagues have talked about, um, we have a serious shortfall of staff across the health and social care sector uh, predicted to be uh, 18 million staff short by 2030. But that's also an opportunity to create new and meaningful jobs. And how do we do that from an economic model? Well, the World Health Innovation Summit, that's our platform that we developed a methodology that gives a pound invested 36 back in value creation. That's currently what we're doing with the UN Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, we're, we're bringing this methodology around the world. We're raising the investment to support 25 cities initially and five indigenous communities. And through the alliance and with James, we're building this evidence base so that we can then export it to Australia and encourage that 70 million, for example, Mark, I think that you quoted and, and uh, Charlie, well, think about the value that can be created by 70 million by 36. That's your opportunity cost. Um, so there's a huge opportunity in terms of next steps and what do we do next? Well, myself and James are very fortunate. We have the opportunity to present this work as a global solution to the G20 in May in Berlin. And we're very excited to do that. And we're very much looking forward to working with yourselves in Australia to bring that evidence base and bring this knowledge uh, forward so that we can improve people's health and well-being while creating new and meaningful jobs and strengthen existing healthcare systems. And that's what some of the lessons that we've learned over the last 12 months. So I'll close off. Um, if anyone would like to get any further information, do check out our websites. Um, and for ourselves here, we just want to thank everyone for taking part and we wish everyone uh, the best of luck today. Thank you and bye-bye.